Welcome back to Gameplay Classics. I'm your host, Rick Lemieux, and I want to say a big thank you for all the positive feedback and all the positive comments about the show. I'm having a blast making these, and I hope you're having a blast watching them. I also want to say a big thank you to The Book Bin for sponsoring the show. You can check them out on the web at www.books.ca. Now for this episode, I'm going back to a console that should be in anyone's top 5 gaming platforms of all time. The Super Nintendo Entertainment System. When you decide to step up to this kind of power, this kind of challenge, this kind of flying, crashing feeling, when you decide to get serious, there's only one place to come. The games of Super Nintendo. No one else creates this kind of experience. Because no one else creates these kinds of games. Now you're playing with power. Super power. The Super Nintendo was Nintendo's second video game console. It followed the Nintendo Entertainment System, which is credited for saving gaming after the video game crash of 1984. The NES did face challengers from both Sega and Atari, but won that battle with ease. The NES had the most third-party support, which translated to many great games. The Sega Master System was still an amazing system but didn't offer the variety that the NES had. At that time, Nintendo had made exclusive deals with third parties, stopping them from releasing their games on the Sega and Atari systems. This led to Sega releasing the Genesis, which was a 16-bit console, to battle the NES, which was an 8-bit console. Nintendo had to counter Sega with something, and that something was the Super Nintendo. The battle between the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis is legendary amongst gamers. I still remember having arguments with schoolyard friends about which one was the best. At that time of the battle, my allegiance was with Sega and the Genesis. In my opinion, there were more good games coming to the console. Of course, the Genesis was the console that I owned. On the flip side of the battle, when Nintendo would release a game for the Super Nintendo, it would help revolutionize games. Games such as Super Mario World, Star Fox, The Legend of Zelda, Donkey Kong Country, Super Mario Kart, and many others are still amazing games today. Sega and the Genesis have started a video game war with Nintendo, and this was a fight that Nintendo was ready for. On August 23, 1991, the Super Nintendo was available in North America. The console was priced at $199 and was packaged with the classic Super Mario World. Introducing the next generation from Nintendo, New Super Mario World, created especially for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. It's a bit more exciting, a bit more challenging, a bit more graphic, a bit more colorful, a bit more realistic, a bit more levels, a bit more secrets, a bit more enemies, a bit more friends, a bit more sound, a bit hotter, a bit cooler, a bit weird, a bit more revolutionary, a bit more Mario, a bit more of what you want. It's 16-bit, and it's yours only if you get new Super Nintendo. Now you're playing with power. Other games that were available at launch were SimCity, Gradius 3, F-Zero, and Pilot Wings, which showed an advantage that the Super Nintendo had over the Genesis, Mode 7. This feature would give gamers the impression of three-dimensional graphics, and would be used in games such as Super Mario Kart, Super Mario RPG, Legend of the Seven Stars, as well as others. The Genesis countered with the term Blast Processing. Now what exactly is Blast Processing? The Sega Genesis has Blast Processing. Super Nintendo doesn't. So what's Blast Processing do? And uh, what if you don't have Blast Processing? Both consoles were amazing and each had advantages over the other. And what it came down to is which system had the games that you wanted to play. This battle was amazing for gamers, with both Nintendo and Sega pulling all the stops to get your gaming dollar. The best part about being an adult gamer is you're not blinded with fanboy goggles and you can enjoy all the consoles, because it's not the hardware, it's the software. Of course, it's easier not being a fanboy when you could afford to buy whatever game or console you want and you don't have to ask your parents. One game that really amazed me when it was released was Donkey Kong Country. Amongst consoles that were more powerful in terms of graphic capabilities, like the 32X and the 3DO, Donkey Kong Country showed that the aging Super Nintendo still had some legs. The game was released on the 24th of November, 1994. Of course,
course, Donkey Kong got his start in Donkey Kong Arcade, playing the villain against Jumpman, who would later become Mario. He then became the victim in Donkey Kong Jr. and returned to his villain ways again in Donkey Kong 3. By 1994, the character was so loved by gamers that Nintendo wisely made him into a lovable character with a tie. The game was developed by Rare, who would go on to make many great hits for Nintendo consoles and who would later be purchased by Microsoft. The story in Donkey Kong Country is a bit silly, but that's one thing that is great about video games. Donkey Kong wakes up to discover that the giant horde of bananas he'd stashed have been stolen. He heads out to find out what happened to his bananas. The game takes place on Congo Island, where the Kremlins, who are ruled by King K. Rule, have invaded and it's up to Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong to bring order back and get their bananas. Your adventure is across many locations on the island, like the jungle, caves, treetops, underwater lakes, snowy mountains, ruins, and industrial factories. The levels have many enemies, which can usually be defeated with a simple jump on the head. There are also some animals that appear in certain levels to lend a hand. Rambi the Rhino is your trusty strong pal, Expresso the Ostrich is a fast but flightless bird, On Guard the Swordfish who can defeat baddies with his big pointed nose, Winky the Frog is a pretty good jumper, finally there's Squawks the Parrot who will follow you around with a torch in some of the dark levels. I don't remember this game being this tough, but I had a very hard time completing it. Thankfully there are many ways to increase your lives. You can collect 100 bananas or collect a 1-up balloon. If you're lucky enough to find three golden statues that represent your animal buddies, you will enter a bonus room where you have a limited time to collect as many golden statues as you can. And again, collecting the magic 100 will result in another life. You can also find hidden letters in the levels to spell Kong to gain lives. Each location on the island have an end level boss. And these end level bosses can be pretty easy to defeat. After you learn their pattern, of course. The graphics in Donkey Kong Country were amazing at the time, and are still impressive today. Everything is rendered beautifully, and the game has a lot of variety in the levels. A problem I had with the graphics is that sometimes, it's hard to judge where you can land. This is a small complaint, and this game deserves all the praise that it received. The sound is as impressive as the graphics. Rare pushed the Super Nintendo to its limits with the soundtrack of this game, which again, still impresses today. Now I find the control in this game a little loose, and I don't find it's in the same category as Super Mario's 2D Adventures, but this is close. Donkey Kong Country is quite long and has a lot of variety in level designs, and I encourage everyone to give this game a playthrough. The game has seen ports on the Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, and more recently on the Wii Virtual Console. With Donkey Kong Country Returns being released on the Wii in November 2010, gamers will be going bananas once again. Now this game is a masterpiece and showed the world the power of the Super Nintendo. The only problem I had with the game was the difficulty and the control in some areas. And even with these problems, the game still deserves a 4 out of 5. Now thanks for watching, and keep playing the classics.